Quiero presentarles a, a los ponentes de esta primera mesa, que se titula Colectividad. La idea es indagar sobre esta noción, en este caso hablar de asociaciones, de, de situaciones, de formaciones y, y fenómenos callejeros, decíamos en, en la descripción de la mesa, como pueden ser desfiles, marchas, procesiones, manifestaciones artísticas, producto de movimientos sociales o acciones políticas. Nos interesaba con esta mesa hablar de, de la enunciación en el espacio público, ya sea por medio de un grupo de personas, de las políticas, de la visualidad que se dan en la calle. Y, y esto visto desde, de nuevo, desde el arte, desde el trabajo eh, de investigación también. Están con nosotros Toby Mayer, que es curador y escritor alemán, vive ahora en Sao Paulo, se desempeñó como curador asociado de la 30 Bienal de Sao Paulo, creo que es... Voy a esperar. Se desempeñó como curador asociado de la 30 Bienal de Sao Paulo, anteriormente colaboró en Manifesta 7 y en Robereto en 2008 y trabajó como curador en el Frankfurter Kunstverein. Están las, las biografías completas y más detalladas en, en el programa, en donde pueden ver más detalles de, de cada uno de nuestros invitados. Por ahora eh, diré que su, su presentación se llama Desfiles y procesiones, y es una colección de, de una investigación que, que ha llevado a cabo, en donde ha reunido una serie de, de materiales de, de trabajos de artistas. María Shekonatsky, que vive entre Londres y Moscú, es una teórica curadora y activista rusa que realizó, realizó estudios de filosofía en la Facultad de Filosofía en la Universidad Estatal de Voronezh, Departamento de Estudios Culturales. Eh, entre sus temas de, de investigación, eh, una, una de las teóricas a las que hace referencia muchas veces es Judith Butler y su idea de la precariedad y, y hoy día nos va a hablar de, de trabajos de artistas en, en Rusia eh, en, en un momento después de, de la Unión Soviética, en condiciones post-soviéticas. Por último, nos acompaña Alina Katsov, de, de Canadá, vive en Nueva York. Ella está aquí como un agente de Public Movement, que que ella ya nos describirá el trabajo de este grupo de artistas de, de Israel, así que no me voy a detener en, en describir el trabajo de, de ellos. Desde 2011, Katsov ha trabajado extensamente con este grupo de artistas en la investigación y desarrollo de proyectos como Salons y, eh, y otros proyectos realizados en, en Nueva York, que es donde entró en contacto con ellos y, y empezaron a trabajar. Hoy día, no, se nos parecía a Marzo y a mí, complican la, la idea de la colectividad en, en un sentido muy, muy productivo por la manera en cómo trabaja este grupo y, y por cómo eh, se apropian de, de la lógica de, de las políticas de la visualidad en el espacio público y en varios cuerpos de, de poder, muchas veces, en la sociedad. Vamos a empezar con Toby Mayer. Eh, después seguimos con María Shekonatsky, después con Alina Katsov. Las, las preguntas dejémoslas para, para después de las tres presentaciones. Eh, así que bueno, le paso la palabra a Toby. Ok, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction and for uh, the invitation to present a paper here in Mexico City within the context of Estar los unos con los otros. The topic of togetherness seems to be very timely. Estar los unos con los otros o miteinander sein, como nos sí falou, 
triggers associations with Roland Barthes' lecture series, How to Live Together, at the Collège de France in 1978, and I see that he is also included in one of the publications for this symposium. The title of these lectures also set the starting point for the 2006 Sao Paulo Biennial, entitled Como Viver Junto, or How to Live Together. And only last week I received bulletins that at Casco in Utrecht, the artist Christian Nian Peter currently unfolds his long term research project, How to Live Together. And How to Work Together is a shared program of contemporary art commissioning and research organized by three not for profit London galleries. In a few weeks, I will be chairing a table organized by IFA in Frankfurt that is inspired by Richard Zenet's recent book, Together. There, the title of the event is Togetherness, Opportunities and Limitations in International Art Exchange. And most recently, Jose Esparza invited me to contribute a paper to an e-book of the New Publics Forum that he is currently curating for the third Lisbon Architecture Triennial, which opens in mid-September, and I took his invitation and yours as the starting point for the formalization of a research that I have been working on for a while, collecting a lot of material and references. I'm glad that Marcio and Paula have given me the opportunity to develop, to develop this paper within the context of this conference, and I would be very happy to hear your feedback, criticism, and ideas. The paper that I'm presenting, as Paula said, is entitled Processions and Parades, which proposes a mass of people in movement communicating an idea, a protest, or a message. Processions and parades often depart from a more static moment, which is the square, and I will get to that in a moment. Co-appearing, however, as Jean-Luc Monsi has put it, does not simply signify that subjects appear together. It would still need to be asked from where it is that they appear, from which remote depth do they come into being social as such, from what origin. We must also wonder why they appear together, says Monsi, and for what other depth they are destined distant or together or further on together. Either the predicate together is only a qualification that is extrinsic to subjects which does not belong to the appearance of each one as such, but designates a pure indifferent juxtaposition. Or it adds a particular quality, one granted a meaning of its own that must be worked out for all subjects together and as together. These questions, almost poetically formulated, lead straight to the dead ends of a metaphysics, so no see, and its politics in which one, social co-appearance is only ever thought of as a transitory epiphenomenon, and two, Society itself is thought of as a step in a process that always leads either to the hypostasis of togetherness or the common, or to the hypostasis of the individual. Hypostasis, or the shared existence of spiritual or corporal entities, and how theater or performance transcends into public space comes to mind when we are thinking about estar los unos con los otros or about processions and parades. Bertolt Brecht's plays frequently suggest an underlying truth about the events represented on stage, and while his theater alienates the identity and actions of the characters for the spectator's critical assessment, the performers themselves often serve as agents of truth. Creating the ability to raise critical consciousness for Brecht, epic theater appeals less to the feelings than to the spectator's reason. Instead of sharing the, the experience, the spectator must come to grips with things. 
You also think of Augusto Boas theater in Brazil, for example, in which all participate freely, neglecting the distinction between protagonists and chorus and between actors and spectators. I'd like to think that the public square challenges divisions within the masses. It offers space to create links among all present in order to engage in an enunciative practice. Here we see an image We see an image of an architectural experiment in front of the Maria Antonia Art Center in the center of Sao Paulo that recently was enacted during a design fair that took place in Sao Paulo and that somehow artificially suggests the benefits of the meeting place, the Agora, here titled Zona Verde or Green Zone. Nearby, that art center in Sao Paulo, in the center, I'm currently working from a residency on Praça Patriarca. Praça Patriarca resembles one of the very few public spaces in that city. In the center of Sao Paulo, there are still some public squares. Once you get into the wealthier neighborhoods, you see they have been evicted from the city planner's vision and perspective and the developer's implementation. They simply do not exist there. You will even have trouble to find a bench to sit on. Now, on this square in front of my residency, we have Ecuadorian bands playing next to a clown circus performer who dances along with castanetas to Elvis Presley's music. You have a disabled homeless person praising Jesus in front of the church. You have someone advocating the rights of black people in Brazil. You have almost daily protests in front of the city hall, which is adjacent to the square. And you have a void at night, because almost no one lives around there. A recent occupation of a high-rise former hotel has been evicted. A few days before I left to Mexico, this tent city was erected for one night around this great tree. Day, one day demonstration seemed to propagate network marketing as a distribution system directly from the manufacturer to the consumer. Then the hot dog sellers were taking charge of the site and demonstrating for their rights in a caravan that stopped in front of the city hall and distributed hot dog gratis. However, rather than focusing on the theater of Brecht and Boal or the events on the square in front of my residency, I would like to address processions and parades, theaters on the move, which in the context of professional circles, such as those of contemporary arts, one-off events, exhibitions, biennials, public art projects, or museum moves, moves have been proliferating over recent years. My contribution to this conference thus serves as an attempt to sketch out some conceptual and political mo motivations and repercussions behind artists' growing involvement in the organization of processions and parades in the public domain. The square, like the street, appears in historical and topographical examination as the venue for the procession or parade, a medium of public manifestation. Over centuries, processions have been a form of public celebration. In the Middle Ages, processions were used as a means to manifest and visualize conflicts in society. The physical routes that processions take often bypass representations of significant power within a community, as they are deliberately designed with, references to, with reference to places recognized as important. In the Basel-Freiburg region, where I grew up, and in Brazil, where I currently live, the history of processions is also strongly connected to the tradition of fashion and carnival. But processions are also linked to a more conscious stance stemming from the urge to take to the street to demonstrate. 
In contrast to the jovial celebratory performance of Carnival, an apparent association with parades links these events to the military, Soviet demonstrations, for example, of power during the Cold War, and thus with an affirmation of the powers of a political executive. Here is still from Josef Robakovsky's powerful 84 video, Art is Power. In the history of manifestations and spectacle, we explore the possibility of conceiving the parade as an event that has a scripted route and routine, as opposed to the situationist idea of the derif. As a concrete proposal, the parade seems to convey a more affirmative or oppositional and critical potential than events relying on improvisation or pure spontaneous individual interpretations. This distinction leads to the differentiation between parades and processions, namely that in contrast to emotive movements, there is an absolute control of movements intended in the parade. I have been exploring the idea of the voice and its link to the collective manifestation on the public square in my essay for the 30th Sao Paulo Biennial, The Imminence of Poetics in 2012. And I consider the instance of voice not only literal as vocal, but also as a manifestation of the presence of the body in movement and occupying space. To continue considerations on the transformation from passive spectatorship to an engaged position, the notion of the voice and the public square proves helpful. And as Marcio also outlined in his section, owing to the Arab Spring and the Occupy Wall Street movement, among many others, both notions, the voice and the square, have gained momentum in public debate, bringing to a renewed collective awareness the fact that populations around the world have long manifested protest, embracing the notion of the voice and the public square to the ignorance of mainstream media. Voice of groups pressing for change has been articulated in direct interaction by means of chants, marches, banners, and hand signals. Simultaneously, voice has been manifested in the virtual sphere of the internet. The direct and the virtual interaction produced a new mode of parallel living, being within a physical community and within a cyber one. Yet, however valuable the virtual dimension can be, the physical one remains of elementary significance. Rather than raising one's voice in private or in virtual worlds, it must be manifested in public. As philosopher Juliane Rebentisch observed, significant mass of demonstrators comes together to turn the need for public visibility from a private concern of individuals violently, hysterically, or otherwise desperately looking for public attention into a matter of public relevance. Regarding the notion of the physical presence, a recent review of Richard Sennett's book Together, Corinne Jones outlined in the Guardian newspaper of London, face-to-face -face activity has become an increasingly scarce resource, and yet it is only in face-to-face -face activity that the most fruitful forms of cooperation are to be found. As Senate notes of his own experiences, when internet collaborators discover something they really want to do together, they tend to jump on a plane in order to meet. Great for people who can afford it. Those who can't get stuck with the Ersatz version. It's hard to avoid then the conclusion that we live in a world in which small wealthy elites are getting better at cooperating with each other and everyone else is getting worse. The contemporary public square, like voice, thus overlaps a geographical location and a virtual one. A square in a village and in a city forms the basis for networks of interaction. On a square, different groups, otherwise separated by their identity distinctions, encounter each other. On a square, they can see each other, hear each other, and smell each other. They can activate all their senses for exchange. 
a square is the central space for forming congregation. It heralds participation and self-determination. In antiquity, it functions as the major site for all forms of civic life. Its historical predecessors originate in meetings held at natural occurring sites with features such as megaliths, great trees, large water meadows or fields, clearings or springs. The function of the square can disguise itself in different forms as a substructure for encounters among individuals. In the modern era, the processional mode can be viewed as a privileged vehicle for articulation, for a collective to assert its shared commitment to a cause. This manifestation is significant on two levels, outwardly or towards the exterior, to a viewing audiences that witnesses the display, but also inwardly for the group of participants themselves. An analysis of the role of the individual within the preparation, rehearsal and enactment of collective performance such as the procession can be found in the French philosopher Gilbert Simenon's thesis, which analyzes that the collective and the group life are not, as commonly assumed, the conditions under which the individualistic characters of the subject disappear or die. Instead, the opposite is the case. The collective experience fosters the terrain of a new radical individuation. Consequently, one could assume that the collective does not deny the characteristics of the individual, but offers the possibility to finally activate what Simonon defines as the pre-dormant, pre-individual reality. According to Simenden, the individual thrives as part of the collective to elaborate on its unique individuality. Only in the collective and not as an isolated subject, it is possible to translate perception, language and productivity into an individualized experience, he argues. His position resonates with what American art historian Alexander Albero has called the re-emergence of philosophical aesthetics. Albero writes that meaning in such art is determined by usage and is located after spectatorship, in the experience-based knowledge that requires an active participation on the part of the public. Consequently, participatory and durational artworks, such as processions and parades, construct and unfold meaning while they are taking place and while they are being experienced. Because artists organizing a procession or parade seek the collaboration and immediate response of participants, transposing their ideas into the public sphere through a performance that often entails a variety of sculptural elements, props, costumes, and of course, music. Like with other ephemeral artworks and performances, artists as well as participants document their event using time-based media such as video and film, thus freezing the actual moment and experience of the event. In addition to the props and sculptures, banners and so forth, materials from development stages of the event, such as preparatory drawings, sketches and photographs are also gathered into a more or less formalized record of the event and the process leading up to it. Oral accounts of the participants constitute yet, an, yet another form of capturing the fleeting moment and creating an afterlife for the event. These are later exhibited, not only, also several exhibitions that have addressed or homogenized the idea of processions and parades, namely, Parades and Processions, Here Comes Everybody, 2009. Russian artist Nathan Altman became known as the designer of post-revolutionary parades and monuments, for example, the first anniversary of the revolution of ne November 7, 1918, in Uritskaya, now Dvorzovaya Square in St. Petersburg, showing abstract geometric shapes in huge panels. 
In Brazil, during the 30s to the 50s, through the 50s, the architect, engineer, set designer, and playwright Flavio de Carvalho created some public performances that were drawing attention. The first known, dated from 1931, and was titled Experience Number no. 2. It occurred during the Corpus Christi procession in the center of Sao Paulo. There, the Carvalho infiltrated the procession without removing his hat, thus showing disrespect for a religious ceremony. In 1956, so more than 20 years later, with Experiencia Tres, Experience Three, the Carvalho launched summer attire, the new look, this time strolling through the center of the city wearing his new look, followed by businessmen mostly. The work in the financial district of Sao Paulo included a stop for coffee in a, and, a, and a visit to a cinema that had a strict dress code and concluded at the headquarters of the media enterprise Diarios Asociados where the Cavallo gave a press conference thus amplifying um, the repercussions of um, his performance using all sorts of media. In her work Ligia Pape questioned the character of objectual art and created experiences. Divisor was originally held in the streets of Rio de Janeiro in 1968. It consists of an immense white fabric which can be seen as a large-scale monochrome and is activated by a participant public. Here we see an image of a recent reenactment in Hong Kong. Mutant amorphous forms set throughout the piece reflect the subjectivity of participants who struggle between individualism and solidarity with the collective experience. In the 1970s, other contemporary artists continued to use the means of processions as a vehicle for communication. In late May 1975, the French artist Daniel Buren asked a group of individuals to walk across seven locations in Manhattan, New York, while wearing Buren posters designed by using five colors. Buren instructed the participants that if someone on the street asked about the reason of the parade, they should only announce the color of their poster. Waitresses were a collective of feminist performance founded in 1977, composed by artists who also worked in bars and restaurants, forming the all-city waitress marching band at the Duda Parade in Pasadena in 1979. Despite the conceptual and political implications of the artists' work, parades and processions remain visual spectacles. They do convey social meaning by symbolic choreography through space. Within the contemporary procession projects by artists such as Francis Alice or Jeremy Della or Christian Philip Müller, Pierre Huyck or Anthony Miralda and many others have engaged with local community groups, clubs or splinter groups for the production of a procession or a parade. Others, like Arthur Lindsay, for example, often collaborate with students, performers, or other artists to create the different elements, costumes, sculptures, and music that contribute to the procession. My hypothesis is that by participating in the artist's performative work, these groups are given a platform to voice their opinion or raise awareness for their often marginalized traditions, rights, or causes. Thus, for example, when organizing social parade in San Sebastian in 2004, during the opening days of Manifesta 5, the English artist Jeremy Della collaborated with a number of groups such as the blind, the elderly, disabled wheelchair users, HIV rights activists, 
who are, it was argued at the time, prevented from being actively engaged in street protests and demonstrations by the region's severe political contexts, meaning by lots of uh, political parties claiming the streets on a regular basis for their own. With social parade, Della seemingly wanted to give voice to those concerns that are rarely voiced in public, in a public debate dominated by separatist struggles. For procession in 2009, which took place in Manchester, it was similar. Della collaborated with groups ranging from big issue sellers, singing chip shop owners and the Boy Scouts, among many others. As Della has said about processions, I think they tell you a lot about the places where they happen, what people think about, what's on their mind. Processions are a very good form of communication, a fantasy version of where you are, a hyper-real version of the place where you are. Working in the former futurist stronghold of Rovereto in northern Italy, the Swiss artist Christian Philipp Müller created Caro Largo in 2008 in collaboration with locals wearing traditional costumes conceived for the 1936 Grape Festival by, future, by local futurist artist Fortunato De Piero. During his first site visit for Manifesta in March 2008 at Rovareto's former Manifectura Tabaki, Müller by chance found a package of Apollo Sojus still wrapped in cellophane produced in Russia for Philip Morris. Intrigued by the image of the copulating spaceships, he started to research its history as well as its relation to the Manifactura Tabaki. He discovered that in 1936, Fortunato de Pero conceived a float, Caro Allegorico, for the factory that resembled a cross of a tank with folkloristic allegories. In direct analogy to this late regional adaptation of a utopian art movement, Müller took the 1975 Space Rendezvous as a model for his Manifesta float. The opening parade for Manifesta 7 then started at the train station of Rovereto and then physically connected the historical center of the city with the, with the venues of the show. A few years later, Burning Love, Luden Füßler, took place on Ascension Day in the surroundings and rooms of Styria's Trautenfels castle and consisted of a piece of locally produced lodden cloth worn by 20 performers on a parade. The 160 foot long strip of white lodden cloth created in Styria was outfitted with 20 circular openings. And for the performance component of the project, 20 men slipped into this oversized raincoat and hiked through the Styrian countryside. Albeit building on a local tradition of textile production, in an accompanying text, the critic André Rotman questions the involuntary adherence of the performers and the social cohesion established. And I'm coming to the end. The question that then arises from looking at these examples, and there are of course many more, is whether the processions and parades are merely triggered by the institutional desire to bring art onto the streets, involve the viewers, and by so doing create a spectacle that rubs off on the mainstream media and supposedly engages a broad range of publics? Or can processions and parades actually be engaging individuals in a critical platform? I would argue that by engaging the public domain and by providing a venue for participation, these performative practices can be considered critical art. Following Chantal Mouffe's claim that critical art is art that foments dissensus, that makes visible what the dominant consensus tends to obscure and obliterate. It is constituted by a manifold of artistic practices aiming at giving a voice to all those who are silenced within the framework of the existent hegemony. Marginalized opinions and groups as well as folkloric traditions can be obliter obliterated from the dominant consensus and resurface within the context of processions. Pro processions are thus an important bearer of memory. 
Inclusion is of primary importance as is the intention of giving a voice to those left without public venues in which to speak in a post-political democracy, to use another term coined by MOVE. Artistic-driven procession and parade projects do not only reflect directly on the conditions of marginalization, but as artistic projects, they refer back to local social concerns as well as customs, rites, aesthetics, and rituals that gather new meaning in a globalized world and carry the potential for change beyond a local sphere. While concluding this text, many European cities have seen parades of citizens demonstrating against austerity measures. Populations of countless cities around Brazil take to the squares and to the streets to voice their discontent about the government's mismanagement of public funds and denounce corruption. Providing artists and art workers with the space to develop ideas with the public within the public domain and create moving subjects, such as processions, is a form of socially engaged curating that is open to a multiplicity of discourses. Not unlike Brecht's theater or other critical media, such as radio, for example, the procession carries its signs and messages out to the streets and reaches audiences that might not otherwise be reached or become contaminated. Exercising the architectural and institutional frameworks for the benefit of the performative exchange of ideas in the public domain, artists, curators, and organizers can make contributions that continue make the public space a site for the gathering of people and debate. Or, as Jean-Luc Nancy would have it, there is no meaning if meaning is not shared. Thank you very much. Le paso la palabra a María. Thanks. Good afternoon. First of all, as we now have small technical problems, I would like to start um, and first of all want to say thanks uh, to Paula and Marcia to invite me here. I'm uh, first time uh, in Mexico City and very exciting to be here. So also thanks uh, to the CPEC team to help uh, with everything. And uh, now I will turn to my uh, talk. So I will try to uh, talk about uh, prosthetic uh, conditions in a more general sense as a transition uh, from, not only as a transition from market uh, economy uh, to the capitalist economy, but uh, also we can see this process as a process of uh, primitive accumulation when the old uh, structures like social, political and economical structures uh, quickly destroyed and dismantled. And, uh, in, in, in this process, we uh, kind of facing um, very uh, interesting shifts, and I guess now uh, it's, we can share this experience, kind of this permanent primitive accumulation, which is basis for, I guess, uh, modern uh, capitalism, and also we can see it in Europe. Uh, 
in a crisis which we're facing. Uh, so what I'm interested in uh, to reflect in this uh, situation, uh, what types of uh, art practices appears in this situation in relation uh, to the community, uh, collectivity, and also in a relation uh, to the social organization of uh, art production. And, um, Okay, now it works. I can begin. So just to imagine for some of you who are not familiar uh, with the uh, post-Soviet context, that uh, in my uh, after so-called uh, shock, uh, shock therapy, uh, it was kind of uh, the situation of chaos, uh, which in 2000, uh, was transformed rather in uh, many localized uh, catastrophes. So connected with uh, exhaustion of old Soviet infrastructures, uh, then there was a long uh, series of events uh, started from the, like for example, crash of uh, submarine Kursk, uh, Kursk. Then there was uh, two Chechen wars, uh, and it continues by a recent explosion of power plants, crashes of trains, and massive uh, forest fires. So just to give a context uh, how primitive accumulation goes uh, hand by hand with this uh, the state of permanent catastrophe. And um, uh, in 2000, uh, this was a new period marked uh, by glorified Putin's uh, stability when um, this kind of uh, forms of uh, shock was transformed, uh, I call it, in, uh, to the post-shock uh, precarious life, which, which was basically normalized, uh, but not abolished. And um, uh, so uh, during the 2000s, there was a new narrative about stability was uh, constructed, and uh, Kind of, the, there was the idea that from the chaos we uh, pass, uh, the, we, we, we transfer to the new positive order. And um, in these uh, conditions, uh, I would say that art community um, survives and uh, continue its own reproduction due to very specific uh, forms of uh, relationship. I call it uh, semi-mafia or informal uh, relationships uh, based on uh, quasi-institutional forms uh, and the legacy of the leadership of uh, some of the uh, members of art community. So just a brief context of the uh, political situation in the region. Uh, in uh, 1997, it was a year before the default in Russia, uh, the key figure of uh, Soviet contempt, uh, conceptualist art, Andrei Monastirsky, uh, mapped uh, the social and economic uh, conditions of the local artist uh, in regards uh, to the new capitalist uh, transition to the market. Um, for the Soviet underground, Andrei Monastirsky uh, was kind of a father who led the other artists, uh, gave them advices, who was the main person and who was kind of a um, person who only can introduce uh, the young generation to the secret dissident elite of the uh, contemporary art in Soviet time. So in late uh, 80s, uh, the part of his art project was uh, the system of uh, hierarchies and uh, hierarchies in uh, contemporary art. He created, uh, basically he created various uh, ranks and titles uh, to control and fix uh, um, changes in the, the small dissident milieu of Moscow art scene. Uh, in 
1990s he realized uh, that his authoritarian rule uh, of the conceptualist type father has no sense uh, in this new reality of the market and uh, capitalism. Because since uh, this uh, discipline, uh, disciplinary Soviet society collapsed, uh, it's collapsed together with uh, the Communist Party and its leaders, and there is uh, no authority and hierarchies in uh, this traditional disciplinary sense anymore. So instead of ranks and uh, uh, titles, uh, he uh, started to analyze uh, and uh, reflect uh, the art community which is now consolidating around the prospect of uh, commercial uh, commissions and official recognitions. So his document which you see on the screen uh, made in 1997 as I said and its document fixed uh, in ironical way this new situation. So here Monastirsky shifted instead of the ranks and titles to the analysis of artists' artists' career and uh, how successfully they integrated into the art uh, market. So this uh, conceptualist document also um, imitating bureaucratic language of the official state papers and also uh, Soviet papers, which was very popular also in the 90s. It's not disappeared uh, quickly. So he replaced uh, ranks and titles, uh, which he did before, like generalissimus or commander, on the statements, uh, as you see here, like um, integrated into the new system, for example, or um, international, uh, which like a new <laughs> um, rank. <laughs> And uh, the most successful is Western, so here is uh, mainly three types, and the, there is the, the last type is local. So local sounds like you are unlucky. <laughs> so you can read, uh, and I, I will read some, some of this for translated to, to translate to the audience. And I would say that uh, the list of the artists uh, is the very famous in local scene, and some of them probably you may you maybe know. Uh, there is not only artists, but also philosophers and uh, curators. Uh, first of all, he started from um, the very famous artists who worked together with him in the same group uh, called Collective Action. So the first is Nikita Alexeyev, who is integrated into the new system, head of department for culture in a uh, foreign newspaper. Current situation satisfies. There is an element of instability because such type of departments can appear and disappear in any moment. However, he has more or less good salary. <laughs> So another guy, uh, Georgi Kizilwalter, also integrated into the new system, works in a uh, custom house. A situation not satisfies, uh, but good salary. Uh, so, uh, and another also interesting, uh, Sergei Gunlach, integrated into the new system, creative director of the self-made design company Right Hand. Situation satisfies. In contrast to the others uh, listed here, he, his conditions are stable because he depends only of himself and can work with any tasks. His income is fluctuated uh, but stays relatively high. He reminded the most successful and advanced among the others integrated into the new system. So you see that uh, some of the people from artists shifted to be owners of the companies, some strange or found very strange precarious uh, jobs. Uh, then you see international people like Mikhail Ryklin, which is quite famous, uh, especially in German context, uh, uh, philosopher. So those days he was marked as international already. Um, developed due to huge possibilities for publishing texts and expanded connections. 
So Vladimir Sorokin, whom you probably also know, is a famous uh, writer who was also mainly translated uh, to German and also in English. So he is also international uh, with very good uh, realization. And just to show the, sorry, I'm very, very bad with PowerPoint things, so that's why I'm uh, do it in like <laughs> not modern style, I would say. So the local people looks more unlucky, like he called himself local with painful realization, and. There is other Westerns with normal realization, not bad realization, um, with good realization. Uh, most of the locals with painful realization and uh, some of them not fully realized and some of them with complicated realization, etc. So this ironic uh, document uh, made in this conceptualist style, uh, I guess, registered uh, the shifts of community towards uh, this new uh, form of uh, art community, which is now, um, which is now uh, based on. Um, uh, this uh, career matter and uh, commercial recognition. And um, so in this post-Soviet uh, situation when um, the previous forms of hierarchy and status has been destroyed, uh, we, 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 we can see that uh, despaired and individualized community is formed. Uh, and uh, this extreme individualism uh, because of career and new obsession uh, by the money and international recognition as well uh, is matched also by quasi-institutional form like the form of one person gallery or one person um, museum or one person editorial team. So when all uh, hierarchies and all the structures uh, as well as official culture destroyed, uh, the only things you can do, you can act uh, above as an individual and uh, uh, you can do some self-organized projects, but they all the time will be based on your uh, charisma and, uh, uh, leader and, and the leadership uh, of the people. So therefore I think the tragedy of uh, ex-generalismus Monastirsky that he became a father of the small art uh, community mafia which task now is to find a way to be recognized in a new social and political context in order to restore the status of the elite in the post-Soviet reality. But however this restoration is impossible in the market economy because uh, new elite is likely would be based on uh, this quasi-institutional forms, competition, leadership, and uh, uh, the uh, hero legacy, which is very far from a Soviet uh, collectivist hierarchical authority, uh, also which was spread in conceptually start. Um, so if the boom of um, this kind of quasi-institutional forms, uh, which was also you saw when the artists run some galleries or strange companies then spend money on some art projects so it was very chaotic and really quasi institutional. Um, it was also a retreat uh, from the normalization um, uh, of the scientific educational and uh, uh, from the scientific education and art institutions. Uh, so in the 2000s, the system of relationships became a, also a side of compensatory mechanism of social integration and protection. If in the Soviet time, Anastersky as generalissimus ex, uh, expect the uh, view on art as autonomous field from official culture and politics, in post-Soviet time, creative power
discover of the artist have been transformed into the new discourse of the moralist dissident elite, which is uh, step by step uh, started politicizing during the 2000s. And um, um, in 2000 also, uh, what is important to mention, uh, and it was uh, a part of this post-Soviet trauma and shock, uh, there was uh, the same provoked the mistrust of any form of official politics and formalized uh, public life. Um, um, when um, mainly all of the artists uh, plunged into the pleasure of consumption, career, pr private life, and uh, especially during uh, the so-called uh, of this Putin stability. Uh, so art community was understood in this context as a new um, underground, uh, which is just a new privileged uh, scene, which is understood what's going on, but prefer to be quite far uh, from brutal uh, social reality. Uh, in this regard, art was from many uh, also uh, liberals uh, a small land of civil society with its own community heroes and leaders. Uh, so there was a strong belief in the Hebermasian uh, utopic uh, of the public sphere with its uh, discursive competition between different groups. Uh, and once uh, submerged in salons and cafes, it can be found again in post-communist uh, art community. However, there are many reasons to think that on the contrary, retreat art into the quasi-institutional forms uh, and uh, this new kind of underground um, and uh, the peculiar subjectivity prevailing in its community-based networks uh, was the result of the horrifying violence of the uh, 90s and a symptom of the rebirth of the repressive state uh, in the 2000s. New legalized uh, dissidents mirrored uh, the disintegration of the social relations and their uh, communities emerged in the wake of the collapse of the official politics and the social statuses. Again, in university, workplaces, art and other cultural fields. Uh, and, um, uh, another important outcome of the system was mistrust to any form of formalized discourse with established definitions and intellectual histories. This type of consciousness was born in the situation of post-stroke uh, aphasia, I call it, when the right words to explain what is going on uh, just cannot be found. We know uh, that uh, one has to use other different pieces, words, discourses and traditions scavenged from the past and present, uh, the result is no more than a strange artistic collage. Art community was populated by communities of postmodern orthodoxy, for example, or liberal cosmist, or I don't know, communist Stalinist, alongside alternative cultural uh, forums. In the middle of stagnant to south and uh, with the swift politicization of this milieu, a bizarre mi mixture of conservative, liberal and cynical postmodernist ideas was, um, was in integrated and kind of normalized and we know that uh, many of the contemporary Russian artists uh, sometimes represent uh, this kind of strange discourses which are uh, difficult to uh, uh, decode uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, in this post-shock society where alternatives, uh, alternative forms uh, of politics uh, is regarded to the ghetto and official public life uh, is uh, con um, concentrated of the affirmative rituals of representatives of power, the only way to break the situation of passivity and silence is somehow to practice uh, the hysterical and uh, obscene speech and this mixture of this Discourses, because there is no other uh, tools to use. Uh, this why actionism became the main artistic movement in Russia and always had uh, a strong uh, political uh, spirit, but politics in the strange uh, post-Soviet sense. Uh, 
All the actions that uh, were produced during this period depended on public scandal uh, to desert the surface of this fake stability. In this situation, only brave Parisians can speak to power uh, because uh, this power was always pers personified and uh, with the expectation and emergence of the leader, uh, the response of the power was uh, always personal too. In such situation, people search for face-to-face -face relations and if there is uh, no, uh, they feel even more abandoned. It does uh, to the face of power, the president, church, and the police. The actionist addresses their provocations. And I will show just uh, some of them, and you will see that they all, almost all of them, um, dealing with these faces of power. Like, uh, Probably the first uh, which appears uh, in 1995, it's famous now performance by Alexander Brenner called uh, uh, Boxing Champion. So Boxing Champion, when he went to the Red Square dressed in short and um, boxing gloves um, and uh, um, start to ask Yeltsin to come to fight. So he was exactly near the place of uh, uh, executions near St. Basil's Cathedral in Red Square and he began to shout uh, Yeltsin come here, Yeltsin come here. So in 10 minutes uh, he was arrested. So this was the, the first action of such type. So another um, I would like to show you is also from 90s. It's performance of uh, Yelena Kavilina. She did this performance abroad in Germany in the uh, beginning of 2000s uh, when she played with a stereotypic view on uh, Russians and uh, also Russian women. She um, wore a special costume with a lot of um, um, special things uh, related to the uh, Second World War, which kind of uh, the um, very famous uh, and very discussable issue in Russia and abroad, uh, and very famous for its patriotic. Um, spirit now, this uh, victory uh, in the Second World War, and uh, she drink vodka and, each, and ask uh, visitors to dance with her. So each time someone wants to dance with her, she uh, drink a vodka with, uh, with the visitor. So then they dance together, and after all she became completely drunk, uh, wearing this patriotic uh, costume. So it will also was, uh, address the critique uh, of, to the face of this power and uh, the stereotypes, uh, which uh, mainly following Russians, especially Russian women. So um, and just another. Okay. I will show you this. This is the performance of uh, Vaina Group, which uh, emerged in the uh, middle of uh, 2000s. The performance uh, was made also to reflect the situation with the power, uh, mainly with the police and church, which now are very powerful and authoritative. So the idea was uh, just to go to the supermarket in a costume of the policeman, but also to, to uh, wear uh, um, the special policeman thing on the head. Sorry for my English, I <laughs> forgot what to and uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, the dress of the Orthodox priest at the same time. So this is uh, uh, the Putin's uh, party union uh, Russia. This is the office and he just went to the supermarket. 
So he went, uh, he went there and collect many things into the basket and then uh, didn't pay and went out. So he just collect a lot of uh, very expensive things like whiskey, I don't know, expensive cheeses and, and stuff, but didn't pay. No one uh, tell him anything. So he just uh, came out and then they celebrate uh, <laughs> so you see this the girl from Pusu Riot that's also was the, the one collective they worked together. So I, I, I'm afraid I don't have the last two probably yeah, yeah, the last and to sum up um, So this, the previous one, uh, it just was in 2013, just after uh, uh, a burst of uh, people, uh, after demonstrations in 2012, and it also was uh, about new anti-LGBT law. So the artist came to the square in St. Petersburg, and uh, you see he just uh, lay on the ground, in this pose, said that uh, in Russia mainly you live uh, in the same uh, situation. And another performance he did was in support of Pussy Riot. It was untitled without any title. And here just he says that uh, we that the Pussy Riot performance was just a uh, reenactment of the famous section of G Jesus Christ. And what he did, he just, uh, you, you, you see on the picture. So this kind of uh, radical performance is all uh, based on this uh, leadership and charismatic figure, which opposed to the dark evil, uh, I don't know, of the power. And uh, the problem I want to address uh, with such type of uh, performances is uh, that this is uh, mm, so touchable that uh, this is very radical and uh, you see um, how active it uh, can be, but uh, at the same time and based on this uh, individualistic and I would say even uh, avant-gardist type of politics that there is, should be some leader who will lead the masses, uh, who will explain the masses what to do and who will only uh, can actually oppose um, him or herself uh, to, the, uh, to the power. So it means that uh, in this uh, destruction of the normal social structures, uh, uh, you can only uh, act politically uh, in this hysterical uh, and very affirmative way. Then the question is uh, how in these conditions uh, we could uh, rethink uh, the politics and uh, the this notion of being together and also um, the problem of um, the uh, permanent uh, catastrophe of new liberal state which provoked uh, such type of individualism and uh, uh, hero legacy uh, and uh, style of acting in, uh, in, 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 in this way. I think uh, that we should, um, we can discuss it. I hope you have probably some ideas and questions. And um, just to conclude, uh, I think that um, such uh, type of politics, uh, mainly based on a first person point of view, Judith Butler called uh, such masculine or first-person uh, point of view. 
uh, also uh, had a problem with uh, that it's all the time uh, playing uh, with international media, that international media is searching, uh, searching for heroes, which story is simple to narrate, which is heroic or dissident, a poison to the oppressive, uh, uh, I don't know, in the case of Russia, Putin regime, in the case of uh, Turkey, Greece, or other countries, you know, other oppressive regimes, and it stood for human rights and uh, democracy. So such type of politics repeats uh, this liberal mantra of um, doing politics, that everything we need is democracy to celebrate human rights, etc. So I guess uh, this is the main problem with actionism and with uh, the conditions which uh, the conditions of primitive accumulation and uh, contemporary political crisis which provoke such a gesture as the only possible uh, response uh, to the current situation. Um, I think the alternative uh, can be found still in uh, collective action and uh, it would be also interesting to discuss lately the distinction between um, uh, protest, uh, collective protest, uh, actionism, uh, it also was addressed the notion of parade and possession, what are the differences between some kind of affirmative types of politics like parade, possession or uh, individualistic uh, performative act and uh, collective action and how in this regard we can rethink uh, the art practices, political organization, party form and other important questions. Thank you very much. Vamos a pasar directo con Alina de Public Movement. say thank you to the whole team at CTAC for having us here today. Is that good? Um, we feel very at home here at CTAC and particularly at this CTAC and on this panel. So we're very happy to be here and we say thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give an overview today of public movement theory and practice by presenting key strategies developed by public movement alongside examples of previous actions. For those of you who don't know us, public movement is a performative research body which investigates and stages political actions in public space. We study and create public choreographies, forms of social order, and covert rituals. Among public movement's actions are manifestations of presence, fictional acts of hatred, new folk dances, synchronized procedures of movement, and other spectacles and marches. Since 2011, I've served as public movement agent. My role gradually developed as the structure of public movement has evolved. I currently hold the title Strategy and Protocol Manager, which you're welcome to ask me more about maybe later on. So public movement was founded on December 29th in 2006 by Omar Krieger and Dania Halami. In 2007, they collected 10 members and declared themselves as leaders of public movement. Over the last six years, public movement has explored regulations, forces, agents, and policies, formations of identity, and systems of ritual, which govern the dynamics of public life and of public space. The structure of public movement is such that it's not a collective. 
or more similar to a youth movement, which you can see evidenced by my uniform, which I'm wearing for you here today. Sometimes we're like a political party, and sometimes we're acting as political consultants or diplomats or delegates. One of the questions that we're dealing with, especially in the beginning of public movement, is what can we do in a group that you cannot do alone? Before I go on with the presentation, I'm going to quickly show you our promotional video. ceremony took place at Rappaport's memorial for the heroes of the ghetto uprising. About 1,300 people participated in the action, which was widely covered by the Polish media. Elias Kennedy reminds us in his book, Crowd and Power, that the transitional moment from being a bunch of men and women into becoming a crowd is a moment of discharge. What do they discharge from? Their social status, their property, their inequality, their differences. When they discharge, they become equal for a moment. But this Kennedy again explains in very bodily sense. It happens when there is density. Mm -hmm. When there is no difference between the body pressing, one body pressing against another body. Each man is as near to the other as he is, as he is to himself. Public movement was thinking about the public appearances of commemorative marches. When I'm leaning against a stranger, walking in a rhythm that I didn't choose, but I'm taken over by the crowd, I feel almost elevated, emotionally and conceptually. The intensity of togetherness is created by this density. It's something we can understand conceptually, but more than that, it's something we experience. It's part of the physical education of becoming a citizen in a country, in a union. When we claim that we do politics, it depends on this mass event. The crowd becomes a crowd once there's a density of bodies. When the crowd runs, you run. We waited for the time of year that was the high season for these trips, so we also came across a lot of the Israeli delegations. Sometimes we became a part of their masses, and other times they became a part of ours. The video I'm about to show you was made by a Polish documentary filmmaker. As I previously mentioned, we don't exhibit this or any other documentary videos. We use them only for lectures. So it's working. Okay. Watching on. Sorry. I'll just make it a bit shorter for the time. because we're going to go to questions. I'll just let it play in the background. Um, two of the ceremonies we created, one created, one was at the house of Louis Blad, um, Zamenhof. The Jew created uh, the language Esperanto. Essentially, we sang a song in Esperanto about Jerusalem in front of his house. Many members of the Esperanto community joined us. We also made a stop in front of the Willy Brandt Memorial. Willy Brandt was the Chancellor of Germany in 1970 who 
came to Poland and went to the monument to the ghetto heroes and knelt on his knees before the monument. It was an enormous historic moment all over the front pages, so significant that the Poles made a memorial for the occasion and placed it in front of the original memorial. So there's the memorial of Willie Brandt in front of the memorial of the ghetto to the, the ghetto heroes. And we came in front of the Willie Brandt memorial and kneeled in front of him, creating a third generation of kneeling. So I, I'm not going to present uh, the next project because I think it's good to go to questions, but I will just tell you very briefly that we, um, uh, very briefly, <laughs> that um, we're continuing to explore the uses and effects of civil pilgrimage, but whereas with Spring in Warsaw, where the, the investigation was rooted within physical experience, the continuation in New York was to explore discursive models. We lobbied to secure participants, and um, we lobbied to secure participants and to create the series of discursive models as a large-scale durational act action. It used the phenomenon of birthright Israel in order to raise questions about nationality and heritage, as well as the politics of tourism and nation branding. Um, so essentially, we were asking questions, proposing the idea for birthright Palestine, which is a very extensive project that deserves a proper explanation, but maybe in the question and answer, we could address it, if that's all right. Yeah. If you guys were here, I think I'm going to speak Spanish. Gracias a, a los tres. Estamos un poquitito tarde para el receso, pero igual voy a tomar ahora el tiempo para, para las preguntas y de todos modos hacemos el receso. Igual después eh, quería poner sobre la mesa una definición más de, de colectividad de la teórica y crítica inglesa Irit Rogoff, que por cierto estuvo en el CITAC pasado hablando. Ella en relación al, al, al arte habla también de un nosotros, de una colectividad que se reúne alrededor de, de ver arte o de ver un, un acontecimiento artístico y define la colectividad como algo que ocurre de manera arbitraria cuando nos reunimos para formar parte de diferentes formas de, de actividad cultural. Y, y este estar juntos en sus palabras se convierte en mutualidad que me parece que es algo que también está presente de, de distintas maneras en las presentaciones de ellos tres como pregunta muchas veces pues creo que hay preguntas interesantes alrededor de las diferencias y las relaciones entre colectividad y colectivo activismo y accionismo hay también eh, preguntas que van en relación a, a las instituciones del arte directamente y como Toby mencionaba el deseo a veces de las instituciones del arte de producir este tipo de, de proyectos y en el caso de, de public movement de negociar con estas condiciones y en el momento en el que se adquiere una obra de ellos poner también ciertas condiciones para que esta obra sea activada y, y se se establezca un diálogo con, con la institución a partir de ahí. El, el actuar políticamente es algo que creo que estuvo presente en, en las tres presentaciones y, y también una pregunta que, que ayer comentábamos eh, superficialmente al menos sobre la, la eficacia eh, de algunos de estos proyectos en términos políticos. En el caso de María, eh, me parece muy importante la pregunta que ella hace en el momento en el que se refiere a, a una colectividad desde un lugar de una acción política de un individuo para después preguntarse, bueno, ¿por, por quién habla este individuo? ¿Cuáles son esos otros individuos en esta colectividad o en esta comunidad a los que se está representando, por los que se está hablando en esa, en esa situación? Eh, quisiera abrir a preguntas si ustedes tienen preguntas y, y o comentarios sino para también entablar una conversación en la mesa no sé si de paso este yes, I have a question to, to me. Uh, you talk about 
talk about processions and parades, still we didn't hear any music. So what's the place for the music? And how would you describe the music that you didn't hear? Um, yes, it's, it's about the place of the music on parades and processions, military or religious or civil or carnival. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't get into any details with um, uh, with regards to uh, the uh, sculptural or costumes or the outfits or the music that has been used in um, in the processions. Um, and uh, there are some of those processional movements that don't feature any music, like uh, in the case of uh, um, Christian Philip Müller's um, processions that I was talking about. And then I guess that um, you know when. Uh, Jeremy Della was working in Manchester, he would be working with um, local um, folkloric uh, concerts and youth concerts who would perform uh, traditional minor songs or songs that stem from that region. So um, I guess uh, that in many of the instances um, that artists produce um, processions that feature music uh, in a particular site, that uh, there is also um, a connection to the heritage of sound or melodies or um, compositions that come from that region um, in terms of um, Arto Lindsay's collaboration with uh, Matthew Barney in the Carnival in Bahia. Um, uh, uh, Lindsay would play songs um, from his own repertoire uh, as part of the band DNA, of course. Um, and when he was performing in Frankfurt, he would invite um, uh, the noise musician Nico Vasellari to perform alongside with him. So I think it's difficult to generalize um, uh, and um, yes, I mean, I'm sorry I didn't prepare any um, video to get um, to discuss this in more detail, but I think, um, yes, you have on one side perhaps a more traditional um, and folkloric and heritage-based um, repertoire, and then on the other side perhaps more um, artistic compositions. Um, this is a question for... Yeah, for Athena. Um, I have the feeling that, you know, all the material I saw in a way um, emulates both the old Zionist choreographies and um, kind of Zionist, uh, or I would say, you know, the Israeli military strategies to kind of infiltrate other spaces. So I wanted to know really how critical your work is of those things that in, in, in a way are being exported uh, besides you know, your art performances or besides your interactions. To me, the, way, the form or the form that you guys take is very problematic. And it's very problematic as a critique of what I see in, I mean, I don't understand clearly how critical you are of um, these things that are clearly exported, you know, to keep the idea of the state of Israel together. So I, I would like to know what you can tell me about that. Sure. Yes, of course. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long and complicated discussion. I thank you for asking the question. I would uh, say it's a bit of shame we didn't get to go into, because of time, so long birthright Palestine, because essentially that uh, project was about using the archetype or the structure of the birthright trips, which as you may know are a Zionist propaganda tool. Um, young people between the ages of 18 and 26 are sent to Israel for free. They get taken on a 10-day trip. They get introduced to historical, biblical sites, etc. through a very Zionist lens. Um, the Birthright Salon, Birthright Palestine question mark project was a very long discursive project in which we engaged with people across the board. Many, um, many of 
of our Palestinian friends, many activists, many academics, um, to investigate the archetype of birthright and of these national structures, and then to try and understand their application and their impact on nationhood and these kinds of questions, especially as it pertains to funding and such. I will say that public movement, I will not as a public movement agent state a position on the Palestine-Israel question. Um, that's not my role here as a public movement member or agent. We are interested in looking at the mechanisms through which the state functions. We're interested in looking at the ways in which civic bodies and power of democracy, these questions are enacted. We work with everybody. It's part of my job as a public movement agent to be a double agent of sorts. I, I do research and meet with and speak with everyone and anyone. And I'm um, not approaching the question with a predetermined set of expectations. That's our role and that's our contribution as public movement. So in that sense, it may be a very unsatisfying answer. I will say that most public movement members are very involved in the Israeli-Palestinian question um, and are active in other ways in their own lives. But I think that, um, yeah, maybe if you want to follow up, I won't say more for now. Alguna otra pregunta? Hay una allá atrás y ahorita paso aquí el micrófono adelante. ¿Alguien puede acercar un micrófono acá atrás, por favor? Thank you. Um, my question is for uh, to um, Sorry, sorry. Um, public monuments. Uh, my question is about uh, why do you prefer the collaboration with institutions? Why is that? Is because there is a lot of people there in the university, or is because the university? I know the university contacted to you, this group, but uh, you have mentioned it that you prefer or you like like um, a group work with these institutions. Why is that? Do you mean um, like the institutions that invite public movement to do a project? For example, the University of Heidelberg and the theater there? Yeah, yeah. Or do you mean uh, the, like the firefighters and things like that? No, university. The university. Um, we work with all different kinds of uh, platforms. Sometimes it's a university that invites us. Sometimes it's a museum. Sometimes it's a... Um, well, mostly those are the two kinds of institutions that invite us, actually. Um, I can't say for sure why they invite us. I can say that um, public movement is engaged in a research process, so when we receive an invitation like that, we're happy because it allows us a way into exploring a complicated question. And it, it, does, that, does that answer the question? I'm not sure if I... Do you, does that? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, because they invite us, I guess. But, um, yeah, it allows us to, to get inside different um, methodologies and systems, which is, which is what we're interested in researching. Lista? El micrófono de aquí adelante creo que no funciona. Paso este. No, es, uh, voy a hablar castellano, pero despacito, que mi inglés no es muy bueno. <risa> eh, no, es más bien un comentario a partir de las tres preguntas que me han hecho pensar en unas cositas, ¿no? la relación de los trabajos con el sonido eh, donde 
está la potencia crítica de las intervenciones que Elena nos cuenta y eh, por qué trabajar en instituciones. ¿no? Eh, yo creo que eh, lo que ustedes, Marcia y Paula, presentaron como introducción a este encuentro eh, es el mismo tipo de, de dispositivo, de otra manera, de los que Elena está, nos presenta. Nos presenta. Porque al escuchar, si quieres hablar, había música ahí, pero además de la música, había el timbre de su voz, la manera como hablaba. Se está traduciendo del español y del portugués, no está pasando. Sí. ¿Cómo? Yo estoy castellano o portugués. <risa> No, 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 no. Yo estoy hablando castellano, español. Ah, ustedes están haciendo los cosillas. Sí. No estaba escuchando. Estoy diciendo en inglés. No hay problema. Quieren que hables en inglés, pero pues no. Okay. Que yo hable en inglés. No. I can't show. No, pero bueno. No, pero es, es, es un simposio en portuñol. Dale, ándale. Estamos en América Latina. Dicha latina. Dale. Es Napoleón, ¿no? Que lo inventó, que es latino. Eh, bueno, entonces. Eh, se empezó ese encuentro con si quieres en este espacio haciendo un discurso que el discurso que inauguró ese espacio con música pero no había solo la música de la música propiamente dicha había también la música de su voz el timbre de su voz y la música que se tocaba era igual a la canción de su voz que era una música que era eh, eh, con un himno heroico ¿no? y que se inflamaba, se, se intensificaba cada vez más, muy sentimental, hacia un futuro, el futuro, con mayúscula, de la revolución con mayúscula, ¿no? hacia todo se caminaba. Y es muy interesante haber empezado con eso y, y ah, de hacerse cargo de las fuerzas que afectan nuestros cuerpos en, en los diversos contextos y momentos donde estamos viviendo para crear a partir de eso no bien el futuro, sino de vidas de la realidad que puedan proteger la vida, ¿no? entendiendo la vida como potencia eh, de creación. Es, me parece muy interesante con mi intervención hacer eso acá y creo que eso sería una respuesta a la pregunta sobre dónde está la crítica de esos cositas que él me presentó, ¿no? más bien esos himnos israelíes sionistas, ¿no? ¿Qué, ¿qué es eso? ¿no? ¿Dónde está la crítica? Bien, estamos acá para pensar y problematizar lo que es estar unos con nosotros. Como decía eh, Messi, ¿no? como, como trae hacia eso sí inmediatamente con comunismo, ¿no? y comunismo, como dice un amigo brasileño, filósofo, que es director de un grupo de teatro de psicóticos, Hoy día hablar de comunismo es casi una falta de pudor. ¿no? Y Nancy estaba ahí reactivando algo que estaba en esta palabra, que no tiene el ton, el timbre y la canción de los himnos que uh, celebran la esperanza del futuro, un futuro que sea el paraíso o que sea el apocalipsis, pero es la solución final, como decía Hitler, ¿no? la solución, una solución final. Creo que estamos aquí reunidos porque eso no funciona más, no, no funciona como para hacerse cargo de lo que se está pasando. Creo que María también en algún momento, si yo entendí bien, porque infelizmente no pudo acompañar todo, también hablaba cómo salir de esa idea de política solo como uh, lucha por derechos civiles, ¿no? Eh, en fin, entonces, empezar así convoca a nosotros que estamos acá, que no somos participantes, sino partes del acontecimiento que se está haciendo aquí, convoca a nosotros fuerzas eh, muy presentes en la subjetividad de cada uno, una que todavía canta el himno del futuro, 
y otra que se, se hace muy molesta con eso y que tiene que reconocer que no es más eso, que algo se pasa, que no encuentra posibilidad de, de expresarse a través de ese tipo de cosas. ¿no? Creo que estamos reunidos acá exactamente no para, ah, eso no, eso sí, sino para compartir con cada uno de nosotros maneja la presencia muy fuerte de todos esos dos tipos de fuerza en la subjetividad de cada uno, como qué dispositivos cada uno inventa en su vida cotidiana, en sus escritos, en, su, en sus prácticas artísticas, o en la organización de un simposio, o en la manera como se hace cargo de una curaduría, para problematizar la fricción, la tensión entre estas distintas fuerzas eh, que hacen que estar unos con los otros no puede ser generalizado porque puede ser practicado desde muy distintas eh, políticas de deseo políticas del pensamiento en fin pues no lo puedo poner mejor <risa> gracias um, eh, yo tengo una pregunta um, es un poco de preocupación um, voy a intentar como un poco hacer un, un, o sea, lo que, lo que, es un problema eh, me da la impresión de que las, las tres presentaciones unas más que otras han usado un léxico um, moderno y después es especificar pero ideas de público como puesto lo privado ideas de, de privado como individual um, idea de público como lo visible, una discusión de, de lo público como el Estado, um, ideas de liderazgo. Este tipo de lógica me parece que no, me cuesta mucho adaptar este lógico para aprender o para entender lo que está pasando hoy en política en el mundo. ¿no? Me parece que lo que está pasando, por ejemplo, en Brasil, o lo que está pasando en en el norte de África o tal vez en Europa también no es entendible con este léxico moderno me parece eh, con ese léxico de lo público de lo puesto lo privado con ese léxico de lo público como el Estado con ese léxico de, de, de visibilidad como lo público me parece que este tipo de, de, de conceptos no ayudan a dar cuenta de lo que está pasando ahora la lucha no es una lucha contra el Estado ahora mismo Igual en los otros, sí, en otros no, pero me parece que, que no es en general eso. En la jubilación tampoco es un asunto de hacer visible. Um, no es que, como Jeremy Deller va allí a, a Pedrasco a hacer visible a la gente lo que está pasando allí. Bueno, esto es una cuestión muy complicada ya desde hace mucho tiempo, pero ese, ese, ese es, un, es, una, es, un, es una cuestión, un problema o una inquietud que quería eh, proponer. Que, que ¿Son esos conceptos válidos para entender lo que está pasando hoy, aquí, aquí en el mundo en general? Uh, could you pl please clarify what, what you mean by the concepts? Which kind of concepts? You mean the language in, in, in general? Uh, do you mean that there is, should be alternative discourse? I mean, in the face of post-colonial, I don't know, what is it? Can you please clarify why you think this language um, doesn't work? And uh, I guess it was no less out of theory, actually. It was basically explanation of certain practices or contexts. And uh, then I just don't understand. Estoy, estoy suponiendo mucho eh, a partir de tres presentaciones muy cortas. ¿no? Estoy, estoy como especulando en, en un uso que habéis hecho. ¿no? Eh, entonces, no, igual estoy leyendo demasiado. ¿no? Pero me parece que, por ejemplo, la posición público-privado, directamente así, como una posición de, de cerrada, es una posición que es una posición moderna que determina eh, un tipo de, de actividades. ¿no? Tú lees Hannah Arendt, por ejemplo, y ahí 
este tipo de posición da lugar a una legislación sobre qué es política o no. ¿no? Eso, eso es un problema enorme, por ejemplo. ¿no? Amplia, la idea de política como lo visible es un problema también. ¿no? La idea de que la lucha es una lucha contra el Estado son, son conceptos que son antiguos, que yo creo que no van, no son usables hoy en política. No, no ayudan, creo. Es una impresión personal. ¿no? no puedes entender lo que está pasando en Brasil ahora como una lucha contra el Estado. Una lucha de, lo, de una organización de representación también. Cuando hablas de liderazgo, hablas de representación. El problema, el problema no es organizar una representación política de lucha contra el Estado hoy en día. No sé, no sé cuál es, pero el problema es que creo que hoy hace falta desarrollar un, un, un aparato conceptual diferente. No sé. No, eh, yo, por una parte... No, I mean, um, I, 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 I find it difficult, Pablo, to follow your train of thought, um, uh, considering um, the um, multiplicity of um, struggle that is being manifest in public space in uh, Sao Paulo, for example, the city where we both live now and work, and um, considering also the fact that there is um, you know, a very um, uh, small market for um, non-mainstream um, uh, media available and to, for, uh, for, to, for the expression of, um, of these public struggles. And so, I mean, uh, I think in the presentations that we've been putting on, um, there has been um, put into um, debate how you could um, discuss something in the virtual sphere, meaning digital media, but also make it manifest in, in the public space. And I think uh, looking at the people who are demonstrating on a daily basis in front of the residency where I'm at the moment, I just don't see any other way how they can um, how they can manifest their causes, how um, particular they are in, in the end of the day. And who listens to them? If Haddad, the mayor of Sao Paulo, gives any shit, um, if some hot dog sellers are outside his door, I doubt it as much as you do. Yeah, but um, but what alternative do you suggest? And um, and I'm just thinking, you know, how um, and you've been criticizing Dallas 2004 piece in San Sebastian. Um, how um, did uh, how the artistic involvement with um, stakeholder groups such as those um, can perhaps uh, amplify the causes of uh, uh, that they are um, putting um, uh, out there? Yeah, and um, and, 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 and an attitude of saying, oh, our modern tools are not uh, relevant for um, discussing these problematics. I think is um, is I don't want to use the word reactionary, but I'd like to think with you very much about how else um, these uh, sort of, and maybe our action is a bit provoking, but um, how else we could, um, you know, think with artists about um, uh, tackling those uh, questions that are imminent to, um, to social and political struggles in the countries that we live and work, no? Um, responder sí, algo y después vamos a ir a un par de intervenciones más y, y al, al receso porque tenemos un receso de 15 minutos podemos continuar ahí la conversación y, y en la siguiente mesa también oh, um, I guess I, I'm, I think it's interesting to introduce this problematic but I would say that in Israel Palestine the issue of statehood is still very important um, and I think that we can absolutely use the question of public and private state in these modern issues when trying to investigate those issues. I think the issue of statehood is central to a lot of the things that were... Yeah, I think... I, I'll just leave it there. I think it's absolutely still a relevant uh, mode of thinking. Uh, but I think that... It, I think that um, It's interesting to introduce these other ideas for sure and to open it up because it's complex, but there are a lot of atrocities being committed in the name of statehood right now. Yeah? And the archetype of statehood is being used. It's, it's, um, yeah. it's, uh, sí. Me parece. No por la traducción, creo que tenemos que ver este.
yo tenía una pregunta por no puedo dejar de dejar pasar eh, que el intercambio que hubo en este momento hago algo muy interesante y creo que tiene que ver más con pues, la incomodidad la incomodidad yo voy a confesarlo de la mezcla de Siqueiros una estalinista y, 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 y Nancy es algo muy difícil de no expresar y también me parece que no está de más vertebrar la idea que creo que en el intercambio sobre las categorías modernas quizás existe algo que yo sentiría muy peculiar porque este no totalmente contento con lo que pasó en la mesa las preguntas que están planteándose que son sobre la, el orden de la coreografía de la existencia política de la no instrumentalidad de nuestra participación pública y de la negativa concebidos como sujetos participantes de una sola pública del Estado y están subordinados a una estructura distinta, yo diría que no son modernas, más bien plantearían preguntas y aquí voy a abrir dos preguntas que me tienen un poco inquieto y mucho tiene que ver con la presentación de Lina que fue muy interesante por un lado me quedé pensando que el énfasis en esta investigación de coreografías en cierta manera presupone, y esa es mi pregunta, que las estructuras de poder son fundamentalmente de orden simbólico, de comportamiento y de inducción de colectividad ese es el problema político por excelencia me parece que la, las preguntas que estaba recibiendo tienen que ver con esta presuposición este es digamos el indicativo de análisis si este es un punto de vista si public eh, significa expresivo ese es el problema que estoy como que tratando de pensar mi preocupación es cómo no pensar que eso es una posición de pasividad si solamente estamos ante estas expresiones hay una segunda pregunta que es muy técnica y es acerca de la negativa a exhibir en un contexto de exhibición incluso los documentales que presentaste pero al mismo tiempo participar en una conferencia exhibiendo documentales por un lado me parece sugerir que hay una diferenciación que no acabo de entender porque si el problema fuera la representación tampoco podrías exhibir documentales en la conferencia me parece al mismo tiempo que genera una segmentación donde implícitamente que es muy reveladora pareciera que el mundo del arte queremos ahora dividirlo entre la esfera corrupta de exhibición y la sociedad de conferencias donde ocurre algún intercambio serio y yo me siento muy incómodo con la, esa segmentación con la segmentación de que hay un espacio de visibilidad que es de conferencia pero estoy quizá interpretando mal esto que viene a provocar una elaboración de esta diferencia de participación gracias está terminando la Wow. <laughs> Thank you for the for uh, the thoughtful feedback and questions. If I understand the question correctly, uh, we're we're opening up a discussion, or you're, you're asking to open up a discussion of. Um, Does the presence of bringing the documentary into the conference complicate our ability to talk about the work that we're actually doing? Is that no? I'm suggesting yeah. that it's a choice yes. for an elite society of talks and conferences yeah. that pretends that that is somehow different from the former public sphere of the exhibition place. Yeah. I'm trying to understand the choice because I think that it's actually limiting and has this elitist element in relation to the questions that the conference is trying, is trying to address. Yeah. No, it's super interesting. It's very... Um, it's, it's a very difficult problem. I think when we were... Um, doing the project Birthright Palestine question mark, 
the expectation was that we were going to do a more typical public movement final action, like a parade, which would then be documented similar to the some of the things I've shown you today. And the main reason we didn't is we felt that the content of what was produced through the discursive sessions, we couldn't, it, it was inappropriate, it, it didn't, that, that content didn't ask to be brought back into public space as we were referring to it before. Um, and I, I bring that up in relation to these ideas because I think it hits the nail on the head of something that we are struggling with, which is once you generate all of this material, once you go through the process of speaking with all the people that we do, that we workshop with and interview, and you collect this material and you have the performative event, whether it's through a discursive session or, or something more like a parade, how we are struggling with always how to how to deal with that information. Um, one thing that uh, public movement has started doing is we've started doing something called debriefings, where at the end of a major project we create a script that talks through and helps us understand and break down uh, the different exchange of ideas that took place. And we only share the scripts on, on, with an audience on one-on-one. -on -one. So as opposed to showing a video of the salons, which we don't, again, the videos were problematic, um, we, we will only talk about the, the process of making the project Salon Birthright Palestine question mark uh, through these one-on-one -on -one debriefing sessions. But that question of how to do that in a venue like this then is still complicated. It, I, I don't know how... I don't know how yet to bring the content here. Maybe it would be better if we just talked about it and explained it. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. But there is, a, there is a conflict there, and I think that you absolutely hit the nail on the head that that conflict creates, it shifts the direction of the conversation we have after the lecture then. So um, we end up stuck discussing um, uh, you know, our mode of operation or the fact that we look militaristic or Zionist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as opposed to what, why we're engaging those forms. Creo que voy a tener que cortar aquí el receso para no perder mucho la estructura del tiempo del del día de hoy. Perdón si hay alguna pregunta que se pueda por ahí espero pueda surgir de nuevo en las siguientes mesas o durante el receso. Muchas gracias a los tres.